a a movie and television, but mostly uh, television writer and producer for 25 years. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how I came to to do this job and uh, what I like about it. And, uh, and then I would love for you to ask questions. I always think it's much more interesting to hear what you think and what you're interested in. Believe me, I could talk for 40 minutes or so, which I guess is about how long we have very easily, but I would much rather have a dialogue with you. So don't be shy or, or afraid of asking questions. I promise I won't be too, too mean. Um, but before I start uh, blabbing at you, I thought I would show you, uh, just, it's a very quick reel, not too long, but it's always more fun to watch TV than to, to listen to people talk. Um, just gives you sort of highlights of, of these uh, 25 years of my career. So I'm gonna screen share here quickly. Can you all see that? Great, let's hope the audio works and I'll start talking after we watch this together. Arthur Dales, former special agent with the Bureau. I need to ask you some questions about- Do you I'm know gonna... what an X-File is? It's, uh, yeah, it's an unsolved case. No, it's a case that's been designated unsolved. Okay, so that's my career in a minute or so. It always amazes me how quickly you can watch 25 years of my, my labor. Um, I thought I'd begin by talking about um, me for a little bit and then, and then talk more generally about writing for television and, and, and this business. Um, I grew up, actually I was born in Japan and uh, moved around quite a bit because my dad was a doctor in the army. And then he sort of left the army and I, I spent most of my childhood in Phoenix, Arizona, which is sort of the Southwest of the United States, very hot desert landscape, nothing to do with Hollywood, nothing to do with the entertainment business, but I really, really loved movies and television. And I was the youngest of five kids and I spent a lot of time by myself and I just, I, I got lost in this world and I, I watched everything. I was an indiscriminate viewer. <laughs> I would go to movies and I would sit through the same movie two or three times sometimes, like watching it again and again. I just, I loved it. And I knew I wanted to be in this business somehow as a writer, an actor, a director. I wasn't quite sure. And then I went to, to university, to UCLA in Los Angeles, 
And while I was there for a variety of reasons, I didn't. I didn't study film and television. Instead, I ended up studying journalism and I went right from graduation to being a news reporter. And I did that for a while. I started out in the Midwest and then I was in New York City for almost three years. And then believe it or not, I was in Paris where I am now um, as a reporter for about two and a half years. And I got to the age of 27, 28. And I just realized, you know what? I don't wanna be a reporter the rest of my life. I just don't love this enough to do this the rest of my life. And what I really, really want to do is get into movies and television. And so at that age, I, as much as I loved Paris and I really did love uh, living here, I applied to film school, to the graduate program, and I got accepted to the American Film Institute in Los Angeles. So I moved back to Los Angeles from Paris. And at the age of 29, I went back to school to start a new career. And uh, I, I got a master's degree in screenwriting. And it was actually, AFI is now considered one of the best film schools in the world, if not the best. It really is an excellent school. At the time, it wasn't as good as it is now. So this was, you know, uh, gosh, almost 30 years ago. Um, but what was really good about it was that I had some really good teachers. And most of all, I had two years to think about film and television and storytelling and to try being a writer and to figure out what it was that interested me and what it was I had to say, which I didn't really know. Um, and I had other students like me who were in the same position I was. And we read each other's work and we criticized each other's work. And that was so hugely important because what's funny about this whole story I've just told you is that even though from a very young age, I knew I wanted to do this, I didn't really know why. And I wasn't particularly good. In fact, I wasn't good, <laughs> right? I, I gave up my career. I, I moved halfway across the world to go to film school and I wasn't very good as a writer in the beginning. And I think what you will find any of you, if you're interested in a creative field at all, some of you may actually be quite good from the very beginning. But if you do, you're one of the very lucky few. Most people who choose to be actors or writers or directors or anything like this, it's because you love it. For some reason, you love it. And what you're saying is, I love it so much that I have faith in myself that if I study and I work hard, I will become good. It's a, it's a vote of confidence in yourself that by applying yourself, you can become good enough, as good as you need to be, right? And the truth is, if you love movies or television or storytelling, you don't wanna just be okay. You don't wanna go, yeah, I'm gonna write okay stuff, right? You wanna be great. You wanna write stuff or, or act or, or make stuff that inspires you the way you've been inspired. And that is not easy to do. So any one of you, you know, we could pick your favorite filmmaker. I don't know who that is. Let's say it's Quentin Tarantino or it, it, name anybody that you love. And they, they are very good, right? Or you wouldn't be fans of theirs. But I guarantee each and every one of you could find things wrong with the movies or TV shows that your favorite filmmakers have made, right? And you'd be right. right? Your, your critical skills are very, very good. And, and that is something we all develop very early. But now I defy you to turn around and just write and direct a movie as good as Quentin Tarantino right now, right? That's a very different thing. <laughs> it's, it's not that hard for any of us to see what mistakes these great filmmakers make, but to turn around and then execute ourselves at the same level is a completely different thing. And so what you're trying to do when you embark upon this path is bring yourself up to that level. And that requires uh, work, patience, diligence, forgiveness of yourself. 
you're going to fall, you're going to stumble, you're going to fail a lot. And in fact, very few of us ever get to that level, but that's the level you're aiming for. You're aiming for the level of your heroes, right? And so it's, it's, a, it's a very, very satisfying career. It's a very satisfying journey, but it's one where you have to be prepared. You may never get where you'd like to go. Like, I would like to be the greatest writer, filmmaker ever, right? I'm probably not going to make that. But I have to, so I have to be good enough that I'm, I'm proud of my efforts, right? And so that's, that's the standard I hold myself to every time. I have to be honest with you. I've had some very big successes, knock wood. You know, I'm very blessed in my career. But I can't say I've ever had anything where I go, well, that's as good as I hoped, I can't say that I've ever made anything where it's like, that was perfect. There's nothing wrong with it. It exceeded my imagination. That's never happened to me. To some degree, everything I have done is not meeting that incredible dream that I had in my head of what it could be. It's, it's pretty good. People like it. It's very popular. So your whole career, you're aiming for, for, for a goal and a target you very well may never reach. But I would say that's not a bad thing. I would say that's a good thing because, because it's so challenging. You will never be bored in this career. You will always be reaching for something beyond your grasp. It'll always be demanding. It'll always be interesting. And because storytelling is about all of us, about what it means to be human, Every problem, every story you tell is different. Every challenge is going to be unique. And if you're doing it really well, if you're really digging deep into yourself to tell the best story possible, you're always going to be learning something about the world around you and about yourself. Because you have to look into yourself and to try to find the truth of what you have to say to then communicate it to other people. And, and you have to dig deep. I mean, you really have to love the story you're telling if you want anybody else to love it. I guarantee you, it's not possible for you to just go, well, I don't really care about this and, and write it or act it or, and then have somebody else. You, you have to, there, there's a cliche, you know, no tears for the writer, no tears for the reader which is to say if the writer isn't moved by something, the, the reader is not going to be, or the audience is going to be moved by it. And that's very true. So getting back to me for, for a moment, and I won't talk about me much longer. Um, I went to film school to the AFI. I graduated after two years and I was still working as a reporter, a freelance journalist for Rolling Stone magazine, Entertainment Weekly, a bunch of other magazines to support myself, to make a living. Um, and I read scripts. Uh, I was living in Los Angeles. And one of the things I did to, to make money was I would, they call it covering scripts. And so that job was, I got paid $50 a script. That's not a lot of money. And I would have to read a script that was being submitted to a production company to, to make it. And I would read the script and then I would write a synopsis of the script and an analysis of it. And I would rate it and recommend whether they should produce the script or, or not. Now, just to feed myself and pay my rent, I had to read something like 10 scripts a week. That's a lot of scripts. And these were all scripts that were professional writers. They were represented by agents. And let me tell you, most of them were terrible. They were painful. Within 10, 15 pages of reading, these are 120 page scripts typically. Within 10 or 15 pages, I was like, ugh, do I have to keep reading this thing? But yes, I did because I don't get paid unless I read it and then write the synopsis. And that experience was really helpful to me in many ways because first of all, I realized, gosh, don't be intimidated. You know, many, many professional writers, working writers are not that amazing. That's sort of good and bad, I guess. Um, but I also, I read so many things that it, it strengthened my sort of storytelling brain and I had to analyze so many things. And every once in a while, maybe every 10th script, it was like, wow, 
this is fantastic. I can't wait to turn the page and see what happens next. And I must tell you, I resolved at that point to be that kind of writer. That the scripts that I wrote, I wanted people to read them and be like, I'm, I'm loving this. This is easy to read. This is a joy to read. I can't wait to see what happens next. And so from, from that day to this day, I am still, when I'm writing, I'm thinking about how can I make this easy and enjoyable for the reader? How can I make them want to see what's going to happen next? Right? Because the thing about being a writer or an actor or a director, or any of these things, storytelling, it's about communicating. It's about reaching an audience. And if you don't have something to say that they're interested in, you're not going to reach them. Right? So, to some degree, forget about going to film school, forget about learning anything. You're just gonna sit down and, and write a script. It's about that. It's about why would somebody want to read this and then turn the page and then turn the next page and the next page and so on. It's about engaging people's emotions first because if you're not emotionally engaged, you're gonna be bored. You're not gonna, you're gonna put the script down or you're gonna change the channel on the TV show. But if you're emotionally engaged by the characters, if you care about them, whether you like them or not, it's a different question. But I care, I'm interested, I'm moved. You'll keep watching until the end. And so to me, that's sort of your challenge is to, to grab people's emotions and then don't drop them. Hold them until the end. It's not easy to do. And it requires you to be to be communicating what it is you want to say, but also imagine how it's being received by your audience, right? And, and that's one of the things you get better at, hopefully over time, is the sense of not just what your intention is, but, but knowing that your intention is going to be received the way you intend it to be received. And then if you've succeeded, people have watched your entire show and they have not been bored. But what I find is there's a lot of stories out there, and I'm sure you, this will make sense to you, where you get to the end and you did watch it, you were not bored, but at the end it was like it was about nothing. It was empty calories. Now that's fine. There's a lot of shows out there where you come home, you just don't, you don't really feel like being nourished by what you're watching. It's sort of just you know, zoning out, relaxing TV. But that's never the kind of TV or, or movies I wanted to make. What I've always tried to make, and because these are the TV shows and the movies that, I, that really stuck with me when I was a kid, the ones that I still love today. I try to make things that are emotionally engaging and you stick with it to the end, but when it's over, it's about something. There was something about it that you're still thinking about it after it's over. So the shows I love, for some reason, decades later, they still reward me. They said something. They asked a question. They presented a character with a dilemma that moved me or made me laugh or enchanted me. And, and that's what I'm always trying to do. And so you're working on this kind of emotional level, this kind of intellectual level. And, this, and then the most important level of all is the sort of intuitive level because I don't always understand when I'm telling the story, why it is that I'm telling the story. When I do, it's great. Sometimes I, I tell a story and I go, I know why I'm telling this, I know what it's about, and here's what's good. That's a huge asset, right? Because it's clear the direction you're headed in, but you don't always know. And then you're relying on your intuition, on your instinct, which is kind of deeper than intellect or emotion. It's a very, very valuable thing that all of us are born with, and you want to to be able to hear that and trust that and, and, and listen to it at all times. So I, I graduated from film school. I'm working as a reporter and a reader to support myself. And then lo and behold, I'm lucky enough to get my first job writing for the TV show that some of you may have seen. I don't know on that reel if, if you've all seen it or not. It was called The X-Files. And this was a very, very big show in the 1990s. It was one of the most popular shows in the world. And I came out at the beginning of the second season. Now, I started 
bottom of the bottom, beginning staff writer. Luckily for me, I was very green. I didn't, you know, my writing was not great, but I understood that show. Like I said to you, I watched a lot of TV when I was a kid, went to a lot of movies and I hit the ground. My first week on that show, I understood it. There was something about it that spoke to me. And from the very first week or two, the creator of the show could see that I was contributing. I was in the way they do TV in Hollywood, they have writer's rooms. And so what you have is six, eight writers sitting around a table talking about every story, every episode, and arguing about what should happen next. And she would do this and he would do that. And isn't this scarier than this? And, the, and it's, it's a debate to, to not to see who's boss, right? But to see what's the best story we can tell, right? You're all in a, in a perfect writer's room. You're all submerging your egos. It's not about, you know, aren't I smart or aren't you smart at all? It's just about let's come up with the best, coolest story we can together. And then you'll go off and write that, you know, Joanne or, or Frank or Steve or Anne, whoever you are, you'll go off and write it. But all together, we're going to break the story. And I demonstrated really early on, you know what? I was really helpful in that room. And then I was sent into the editing room my first week, right? My first job in TV and I was sent in the editing room, go fix this episode. It's not working. And guess what? I actually, I could do it. And so as it happened, I was very, very lucky. And I was lucky. I'm not just being modest. All of us, you do your best, but there's a degree of luck. And you want to be ready when the luck comes. <laughs> you don't know if the luck is going to come next week, you know, next year, five years from now. You just want to know when it's there, you're ready. You can seize it, right? And, 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 and move ahead based on that luck. And I was very lucky because I was, look, I'd already spent a, a decade doing another career, right? So uh, it was a good thing that I, I hit upon this right away. And I went from staff writer, which is the bottom rung of the ladder. And within three years, I'd gone up about seven or eight rungs to what they call executive producer. And that is the highest level you can be in television. And usually, a lot of people never get to that rung or it takes them seven or eight years at the minimum. And I did it in three because I was in the right show. And then I became what they call in Hollywood, which and it's a term I don't like, but they call it a showrunner. And a showrunner is always a writer and a producer. And it means you're in charge of the creative vision of the show. And so that means you are writing the scripts, you are editing the episodes, you are hiring the director, you are casting the episodes, you are supervising the music, you're supervising the visual effects, you're approving all the publicity, right? It's a massive, massive job, but gosh, is it exciting. Like you're working your tail off. I mean, uh, especially, you know, uh, in the X-Files days, on that reel you saw, I think, Four of those shows were during the eight year period I was doing the X-Files. So I was working seven days a week, 80, 100 hours a week. It's just nonstop work. And you can ask, you know, Lawson, my son, I'm still, I still work an, an awful lot. Um, but, but, you know, when you love your job, it's, it, it is work, but um, you get lost in it. You know, the best of times you get lost in it and you, you enjoy uh, the challenge of it. Um, so that was my first job, uh, The X-Files, and we did two feature films as well. And, and then I went on to do a bunch of other shows that you, you saw in that reel. And 10 years ago, um, I sold a show to the BBC and we all moved from Los Angeles to London. And uh, I worked in London for four years and for the last, it's gosh, it's going to be seven years, believe it or not, uh, this summer, uh, we've been in Paris. And my company is still in London, but I've done shows all over the world. I've done lots of shows in Italy. On that reel, you saw uh, Medici. Uh, I'm doing another show right now called Devils uh, for Sky. Medici is on Netflix. 
Uh, Devils is on Sky. I uh, don't know how you'd watch it in France yet. Um, and I have a new show about Leonardo da Vinci that's coming out um, in just two or three months. It'll be on France television. And uh, I can't say where it'll be on the United States and the UK, but it'll be on a big, big platform you'll recognize um, in that part of the world. Um, but I think just, I'll just say this and then I would love to take any, any questions. I can keep talking if, if anybody's uh, uh, shy. Oh good, there's one question already. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer that first, um, but please uh, go ahead and text if you'd like, or, or if you, if you wanna raise your hand, I think there's a facility to do that. Um, but the thing about storytelling is uh, it's one of the few jobs you can have where it's just, it's, it's all good. You, you are not hurting anybody. You are creating something out of nothing. It's still magical to me that you write a script and then some period later you walk onto a soundstage and there's hundreds of people and you film this thing and then it's this, it's this dream, this waking dream that you share with the world and that will exist as, for as long as people want to see it, right? And it's, it's a magical process to me every time out. And, uh, and I love it. So um, it's not an easy profession, but honestly, nothing worth doing is easy. And if you, if you think this is something you want to pursue, I wouldn't discourage you for a second. You will find out as you do it, whether you love it enough, like I found out about reporting. I didn't love that enough. And then I, I changed. But if you love it enough, that love and that faith will sustain you. So let me switch to the questions. The first one is, what is the best movie ever made? What movie script motivated you to become who you are now? Gosh, there are so many great movies. Um, I, I'm just going to name two of my favorites, but I could name 25 easily. I don't know if you've all seen the movie Casablanca. Uh, if you haven't, watch it. It's a perfect, perfect movie. It's with Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman, 1942. It's about refugees stranded in Casablanca trying to escape Europe during World War II. Perfect movie. Also, I'd say The Godfather 1 and 2. Perfect movies. Those, are, those three movies, if they're on, I stop whatever I'm doing and I watch them again, even though I've probably seen them 25 times each. Um, what motivated me to become a writer? Actually, it was TV. It was the original Star Trek series and uh, Twilight Zone, although I watched everything. But those shows uh, really, really were my favorites, and, and I still think about them when I'm writing today. Um, would you say going to film school is super important to work in the industry or do internships also work for experience? You don't have to go to film school. Internships are great. Um, I would say that the most important thing is if you wanna be a writer, for instance, is to write, right? Is to just write. Now, the thing about getting a film education is a good one is going to give you tools, formal tools you can turn to, to help you realize how to write. And that's of course, very helpful but you don't need to go to film school. Many good writers have not, never gone to film school. They just write, they've just written. But the thing is you do need to write. No matter how many great teachers you have or no matter how many great bits of advice you get, you only become a good writer by writing, by doing it over and over again. Same with acting or directing, because then you internalize the lessons people are teaching you. It's one of those things that by doing it over and over again, you get a light bulb that goes off in your head and you go, oh, this is how you structure a story. This is how you write dialogue, right? But it, it's by the doing. It, it, it's something that people can only describe to you to a certain point that'll only get you so far. You have to do it. Um, somebody else is asking, do you write every day? I try to, um, I, I like to. I don't always, every once in a while I take a day off, but it's very few. 365 days a year, I probably write 355 out of those 365 days, at least a few hours. Uh, what genre do you, do you prefer to write and why? Well, it's funny, I love every genre. As it happened, X-Files was sort of scary, supernatural, th thriller, horror stuff. And as it happened, that came really naturally to me. But if you saw on that reel, now I'm writing historical dramas. I'm writing Leonardo da Vinci. Like I didn't know that that was something that was interesting to me. and. and that, as I said earlier, that's the thing about this, this, this profession is you learn a lot about yourself. You find yourself in the subjects you're writing about. Uh, this other show I'm doing right now, Devils, is a financial thriller, contemporary financial thriller. Um, I'm learning a lot about finance I didn't know. 
It helps if you're a curious person, um, if you want to learn about different things. Um, what does my daily life look like? Well, when you're show running, quote unquote, when you're producing as well as writing, which I'm very fortunate to do, I really, I like that because writing is like you're here at your, at your computer, at your laptop by yourself in your own head. Um, and, and I do that almost every day. I, I try to do that in the morning. I find that my mind is freshest in the morning. And usually in the first three or four hours, I'm going to accomplish more than I will the rest of the day. And then I switch to producing functions. You know, I switch to editing or, you know, casting meetings or talking to the director or developing other things with other writers. And every day is different, which is what I like. There's no repetition. It's, it's all unpredictable. And there's crises. There's always something going wrong. <laughs> you have to like being a problem solver. Um, it's not to say it's not without stress, but um, it's, it's never boring. Um, do you have to exercise some degree of caution and sensitivity when telling stories centered around polarizing topics like the man in the high castle? If so, how? Yes, absolutely. And the man in the high castle, which you may have seen that reel, is based on a book by Philip K. Dick. And it's about what would have happened if the Nazis had won World War II. So it takes place in America in 1962. And the Nazis are occupying the eastern half of the United States, the, the fascist Japanese, the imperial Japanese half the west coast. And then the, the Western, the Rockies are sort of this neutral zone. And yes, I was terrified of telling this story because I didn't, I didn't want to offend people or hurt people. You know, Nazis and fascism, as we know all too well right now, are a very real thing. And what I wanted to do, as I said at the time, is I wanted to shed light, not heat. I wanted to give people insight. And I had a lot to say, especially as an American living outside of America. And having spent a lot of time in Germany, I've been teaching in Germany for the last seven years. I had a lot of insights about this. And I wanted, what I wanted to say was, um, look guys, it's not just Germans who can become Nazis. Don't give yourself too much credit, Americans, British people, just because you were the good guys in World War II, that doesn't give you a pass forever, right? It just so happened in that circumstance, we were on the right side, we did the right thing. But unfortunately, hatred and intolerance are universal qualities that anybody can tap into. And every generation that comes along has to fight against them. And so I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to say in The Man in the High Castle. And I was very proud of the first season in particular. I left the show during the second season. Um, and that was one of the reasons, actually, is I felt like they were going in a direction I didn't, I didn't necessarily agree with. As a novice writer, how do you develop an original writing voice style? That is such a good question. And that took me a really long time to find my voice and to realize who I was. And I would say in the case of, of my career, you know, I came onto a show X-Files where there was a very clear point of view. There was a very clear uh, authorial voice. And my job was to, was to tap into that voice, right? Because the audience at home, they don't want every week to have the characters be different people, right? And that show, the heroes were Agents Mulder and Scully. You got to understand who Mulder and Scully are and write their voices correctly. But then you begin to bring to it your point of view. It's consistent with who the characters are and what the show is, but you're bringing to it things that surprise the people who created the show, right? And then you begin to realize slowly, oh, that's me. That's what I have to say. And so over time, you start to recognize yourself and what your point of view is. But I don't expect it to come instantly. It may. There are some people, uh, I worked for many years you know, on that show with this guy, Vince Gilligan, who went on to do Breaking Bad. He's still a good friend of mine. Vince, to me, was out of the gate kind of a genius. I mean, in high school, he was kind of a genius. He just had a voice and a point of view right from the beginning. But I think that's very unusual. And I don't think you should kill yourself or be discouraged if you don't immediately um, have this halo over your head and, and know uh, what your voice is and what it is you want to say. When you're in need of inspiration to write, what do you do and how do you find it? That's such a good question. I step away from TV drama. <laughs> I, try to, I try to like watch documentaries, uh, you know, uh, watch comedies, uh, read a book that has nothing to do with anything that I might adapt, take a walk, uh, spend time with my family, just recharge, take other kinds of stimulus in. 
I mean, I, I've taken inspiration from cookbooks, believe it or not. I mean, just get away from this headspace, go to another headspace and then come back to it. The other thing I will do, I'll tell you, is um, this really works for me. It may work for you too, not just with writing. If I have a problem that I can't solve, I've never had writer's block, but I've had problems I don't know how to get around. At night, I will go to sleep and I will say, I want to solve this problem. And then I sleep and I wake up in the morning and I can't tell you how many times, it's most of the time, I wake up and it's solved. Like I, I've instructed my subconscious mind to work on it while I'm sleeping. <laughs> and incredibly, it, it often works. Cinemas often seems a closed off professional world because it's very difficult to enter, very competitive. Do you think that this is true and what tips do you have on making it? Yeah, I mean, that's part of why I didn't do it. I was like, well, look, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. Nobody I knew ever was in this business. How am I going to make it? And I was discouraged and I thought it's, it's unachievable, but it's not, it's not. And I, and I would really encourage you not to be afraid. That's my number one thing. Don't let fear keep you back. If you want to do it, have faith in yourself, work hard, be persistent. Persistence is more important than talent. <laughs> I know many talented people who gave up. I know many people who were just moderately talented, but didn't give up and have been successful. And to some degree, all of us have a certain amount of talent and you shine and polish that talent until it gleams. And it's so bright that everybody thinks, wow, you're super talented. Well, I've got a certain amount of talent. I just worked really hard. To, to, to make it seem as, you know, as, as, as impressive as I could, to move you as much as I could. And so you need to, to, to stick with it and, and, and not be discouraged. If you can write a good script, it's as easy as that and as hard as that, it will open doors. If you can write a script and people read it and they really like it, if they laugh out loud reading your script, do you know how, how hard that is? or they cry reading your script, you, at a minimum, you're going to get an agent. There's a very strong possibility that will get made. That is such, a, I've read thousands and thousands of scripts. That's so hard to do. But if you can do that, yeah, you can send it to Hollywood. I have many bad things to say about Hollywood, right? But there's, one of the good things about Hollywood is talent will out. It really will. If you don't give up, if you write a good script, doors will open for you. They will. And this is the good thing about education, film education. You know, I, I know people who, who never, they don't know why it is they've written a good script. It's, it's, they have no craft, no skill. It's just all intuition. And so every time they write a script, it's a bit terrifying to them because they don't know what it was they did right the last time. But if you can learn, if you can get some kind of education that tells you, well, these are the, the, the tests you can apply, the objective measures about whether you're doing things right or not. And there are some simple tests. It makes it easier to repeat that and, and to just keep trying and keep trying. Because nobody wants to be a writer or an actor or director and make one film or one TV show, right? You want to have a long career and keep doing it. You want to keep getting better. So um, I would say... Being close to other storytellers is a huge asset. So if you're in Paris, if you're in Berlin, if you're in Cairo, if you're in London, if you're in Los Angeles, New York, find other people who are doing what you're doing. Ideally, people who are at the same stage of their career as you are, because you will have, you, you will share information, you'll share frustrations, emotional support, you can help each other grow. That's the most important thing. Find a community of like-minded people. Who will support you. How do you determine which actors can best represent your character to life? Well, <clears throat> most of the time you do it by having auditions. And I learned so much. Now it's 40 minutes. Tell me how much longer I can, I can talk. I can keep going forever. How, how much longer should I go? I think you can go on for 10, 15 minutes. How okay. ever there's, long. There's several more questions I haven't got to. So, um, I really like the casting process and, and, Sometimes you have to cast actors, they're such, they're stars and they don't read. So you just cast them based on their previous work. And look, they're terrific actors like in uh, Leonardo, I don't know if you're all familiar with Aidan Turner, he was in the series Poldark on the BBC 
fantastic actor. He didn't audition, right? We just cast him based on he's Aiden Turner or in Medici, uh, Richard Madden uh, was in the first season or Dustin Hoffman, like people like that, you're not going to audition them. You're just gonna cast them because you know they're terrific actors and you're gonna collaborate with them and see what they do. But most of the time actors come in and they read the scenes you've written. And I learned so much. Now, this should be some comfort to those of you who want to be actors. Most of the time, they don't get rejected because they're not good actors. They get rejected because they're just not right for that part, right? And that's the problem with being an actor. It's not in your control. You're just not, you're either right for a part or you're not most of the time, right? But, but the actors who are right for the part, they come in and I learn about what I've written by watching them do it. And I start to realize, oh, now I wrote the script, mind you, but the actor is making me see things about what I wrote that I didn't consciously understand. Because as, as I said before, it's an emotional, intellectual, and intuitive process. And the most important part of it, my writing was intuitive. This felt right, that he would do this, that he would say this, or she would do this and say this. And then the actor or actress comes in and they bring it to life in a way and I go, ah, oh, yes, that's it, that's it. I, I understand things, it's a revelation to me. And that's the really exciting to me. Sometimes, sometimes I'll do a, a, an audition and it's like, oh my gosh, my script is terrible. And then the right actor comes in and you realize, no, the script's not terrible. It just needed this actor who understood it to bring it to life. And I think that's what a great actor does is, you know, you're a writer and, and you, you, you write this map, but then the actor finds the emotional contours of it and gives it meaning and steers it moment to moment forward. And it's, it's thrilling. It really is thrilling. And it's a great joy uh, working with actors. I know a lot of writers and directors are afraid of actors, don't like them, think they're difficult. Um, but I think that's one of the best parts of, of my job. Um, Let's see, what's the next one? What would you say is your favorite show that you've produced and why? Uh, gosh, you know, some of the shows I've done have been huge successes. And so people, you know, X-Files still to this day or The Man in the High Castle or Medici. And, and I'm, I, I like that, of course. I like reaching an audience. As I said, it's storytelling. It's, it's about communication. But some of my favorite shows, you know, very few people watched or they only lasted one season but I love them because making them was a joy and the people I worked with, I loved, and that was very rewarding. Um, so to me, it's sort of like trying to pick your favorite child. It's kind of impossible. I, I love all my children um, and there, there's different, each one of them is unique. What do you still want to accomplish? Um, I, I, I want to reach that, that star in the sky that I can't reach. And, um, and I'm, every time out, I always say to people, you know, if, if you start out saying, well, this will be okay. If that's your goal, it's, it's going to be bad. You need to reach beyond your grasp. Your ambition needs to be so high. You need to say, this is going to be the best movie or TV show ever made. I'm really, you've never seen anything better than what I've just <laughs> You've got to believe that. You've got to have that ego. And I'm going to kill myself, really. I'm going to do everything in my power to make it that good. That's the level of ambition you need. You're never going to make it. But if you aim that high, you know what? That was pretty good. You might, you might land here. And so, you know, I don't think I'll ever tire of this because I'll, I'll never stop wanting to, to reach that, that level. And unfortunately, I probably never, never do it. Do you feel that writers and other non-actor contributors to shows or movies often don't get the acknowledgement attention they deserve because they're behind the scenes? Yes, yes, yes. Such a good question. And so, so true. And that's why I hate the word showrunner. To me, it's a bit too, you know, it's me. I'm the showrunner. It's like, no, you know, you you may be the guy or, or the person who ultimately makes the creative decision but there's like a thousand other people who are helping you to succeed. It's a little bit too self-congratulatory. The thing about um, making movies or television shows is it's collaborative. 
I mean, I can't tell you how many people it takes to make something successful. I will say this, the better the script, the more likely you are to allow everybody to do their best. I know every show I have done uh, that has succeeded, it's because my script has been good enough to allow all these other people to do their best work. And the things I've done that have not been so successful, it's ultimately it's because my script was not a good enough blueprint. There was something about it that confused people. So the director thought this and the actors thought that and the composer thought this and the production designer this and the costume designer this. Everybody had a different idea. It wasn't a clear enough map. But the really good scripts I've written, the best scripts I've written, everybody saw it. It was clear and I freed them to deliver their best. And to, like I was saying about me as a writer on X-Files, the, the production designer on The Man in the High Castle, for instance, he brought back stuff. Oh my, it's better than anything I imagined. It's consistent with what I wrote, but what I wrote was so clear to him that he was able to bring these beautiful sets and ideas and the detail he brought. He, he was so inspired. If you were to walk on a set in The Man in the High Castle, the calendars and the matchbooks would all be from this alternate world. I mean, it was that detailed. And the, the, the directors of cinematography, the same thing. And the directors of the shows and the cost, everything was so beautiful and detailed. And I can't take credit for that. It's, it's a team effort. And, and that is the real thrill. And, and that's the funny part about this job is you kind of have to have some ego. You have to have an ego to say, yes, this is a great script. And yes, you should make it. I really do believe that. But then you have to step back and let everybody else come and contribute and make it better than you could possibly make it on your own, right? If you're lucky, you're good at one thing. But you know, I'm, I'm not gonna be the best writer and the best costume designer and the blah, 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 all those other things. I'm there to kind of harness their talents and in many cases, get out of their way. Are you only asked to write about a certain topic universe plot by the people employing you, or do you also write stories from scratch? Um, I do write stories from scratch, but it's been a long time um, because I'm often just like approached to do things now, fortunately, knock wood. And it's funny, in the beginning, when I did X-Files, everybody thought that's all I could do. And all I got approached to do for a long time were things that were scary or supernatural or aliens and things like that. But now, um, after doing it for quite a while, I get approached to do all kinds of things, which I really like. Because I, as I said, I, I love all kinds of genres and I, I'm stimulated by all these different challenges. When you adapt another piece like Man in the High Castle, how do you know that you're uh, maybe not straying too far from the original theme or atmosphere? And that's a really good question. I was really intimidated by trying to uh, adapt this book because it's considered a classic and people love Phil K. Dick. And the truth is, when I said yes to the job, I hadn't read the book in 25 years. I hadn't read it since college. And I went back and I reread it after accepting the job, remembering that I really liked it in college. And uh, it has no story. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have read the book, but it's, it's a really interesting book. But it's about people in a situation. There's no narrative, per se, that you could use for a television series. I was like, what am I going to do? I want to be true to Philip K. Dick. I don't want to you know, anger people who love this book. But... I've got to make a TV show out of this. So, so my strategy in that case was I very deliberately, I analyzed what are the themes of this novel? And to me, the themes of that novel were how do you maintain your humanity in an inhumane world? And then what's the nature of reality itself? Now that's a tough theme, but nonetheless, that's what I identified as the themes in the novel. And then what I did was I built out story and plot and characters who I thought were consistent with the themes that Philip K. Dick laid out to the point that um, when people saw the TV show, they thought it was really faithful to the book. Now I made up a lot. I mean, there's two of the most important characters in the show did not exist in the novel at all, but because I think, you know, it was true enough to the spirit of the book, people didn't seem to notice, you know, how much was different. So, um, I try to capture the spirit and the intention of the novel or whatever it is I'm adapting. Do you ever write prose at any point in your life? Yes, I did. In fact, when I was living in Paris the first time as a reporter, I tried to write a novel. I did write a novel, um, but it was not good. 
it was not. And I have to say, that was one of the things that persuaded me I should write uh, movies and TV. I should go to film school because I, I realized that while I've always read literature as well, really it's movies and TV that is closest to my heart. Um, and, and maybe one day I will give it another shot. Maybe I, I think, you know, the other thing is I have to say, I was kind of lucky, I think, looking back on it, that I did not become a writer right away. I look back on those years I spent as a reporter in my 20s. And I think it was really good for me, you know, maybe not for everybody, but I had seven years where I was kind of growing up and seeing a lot of the world. And, you know, I, as a reporter, I, I interviewed hundreds of people and I, I, I met politicians and covered criminal trials and fires and all kinds of things. And it gave me time to kind of have more perspective. And I think what a lot of people do when they go into writing immediately out of school is they kind of recycle other movies and TV shows they've seen. They're not really writing about their own experiences. And I think for me, it was really helpful that I had that period to kind of just live life. And it gave me more experience to draw upon when I finally did um, uh, turn to fiction. Um, have you ever worked on documentaries? If not, would you be interested in doing so? Um, I have been trying uh, for years to make a documentary about a, a, a writer, a prose writer, a novelist, my love. He's an Italian American writer named John Fonte. Um, most of you probably never heard of him. He's actually very popular in France and Italy and Germany, but not so well known in the United States. But I just, I love his books. And when I was a reporter, I met his family, I met his widow, um, and I'm still determined to do it. Um, and actually, I've, I, I actually have something uh, some good news about that, but I can't say it yet. It hasn't been announced. Um, so um, that that document I've worked on, but never actually made. Um, just yep. a question. What did he write that is most famous? He wrote um, novels and short stories. Um, the, the two that I would really recommend, One, they're very short. They're, they're easy to read. Like you know, they're, they're really enjoyable. They're really funny. They're about being an immigrant. Uh, and they don't read like they were written um, 80 years ago, which they were, or 70 years ago. They read like they were written yesterday. But I would recommend Ask the Dust. I think that's his masterpiece. It's a short novel. I think it's under 200 pages. And then um, the second thing, if you, if you were just going to read two things he wrote, uh, I would say th there's a collection of novellas called West of Rome. And there's one in particular called My Dog Stupid, which was just made into a film last year in France, Mon Chien Stupide by Ivan Atoll and uh, starring his wife, Charlotte Gonsborough, which is a very good adaptation. I think I really liked the film. I would recommend watching that. Um, it's in French. Um, I'm sure you can get it somewhere. Um, have you ever had any particularly bad review and how did that affect your writing? Oh gosh, yes. I've had so many bad reviews <laughs> and, and uh, it's devastating. It's crushing. And actually it's funny, you know, the X-Files came on just as the internet was kind of growing up right? It was still a fairly new thing in the 1990s. And I would go on the message boards, they called them at that point, after the show every week, and look at what people said. And most of the writers were like, gosh, you know, I'm not going to do that. That's way too painful. And it's true. It was like painful, because you would see all these people, you know, what the internet is, it's and um, they were just like piling on and attacking you. And, uh, and honestly, even if you had an episode that 97% of the audience loved, the things that knifed you in the heart were those two or 3% that were like, you know, saying something, those are the ones that stick. That always is it's something about human psychology. It's, it's the, the complaints and, and the nasty things that, that you remember. But I, I, I couldn't resist. I was too curious to see how it was being received. And there was one show we did, which was in that real, I, I doubt any of you have ever seen it, but it was a spinoff of the X-Files called The Lone Gunman. It was these three kind of nerdy characters from the X-Files. And we did the spinoff with them. We did 13 episodes and they're kind of funny characters. And we just loved that show. You were talking about like favorite shows. That, that show was just a joy from beginning to end. The reviews were savage. I mean, they just, they hated it. And the funny thing is it got canceled pretty quickly. And then I would meet critics. Oh my gosh, we love the lone gunman. Why it was only th those idiots that canceled it. And I swear to you, to this day, I meet people who love The Lone Gunman. You wouldn't know, like, where would those bad reviews came, came from? And so it's just taught me, you know, first of all, reviews aren't written for writers. They're written for audience. They're like consumer guides. Should you watch this or not? But it just tells you, you know, 
Take it with a grain of salt. Just do work you're proud of. Don't get confused. I'll tell you one other thing. And I, I teach and I, I say this to my writing students. <clears throat> when you get into this business, it's very easy to get distracted. You know, when I was on X-Files, I look at people who are making literally 7, 10, 20 times the money I was, but we're doing less work or less good work, right? So you get distracted by money. Who's making how much money? or other shows are getting bigger ratings or better reviews or winning more awards, right? That's not why you're here. You're here for one thing and one thing only, to do good work. And I would say, if there's one thing I say that you're gonna remember, cause you won't remember most of what I said, but one thing you're gonna remember, do good work. Honestly, that's any, any profession you're in. That's what's going to nourish you. That's what's going to sustain you. That's when, what's going to inspire you to come back the next day, to get up and do it again, is that you did good work. Be proud of your efforts. Do whatever it takes to do good work. Whatever is going to lead to good work, I am for. Whatever is not going to lead to good work, I am against. It is that simple. And then if you do good work, guess what? you're more likely to make more money. You're more likely to get a bigger audience. You're more likely to get reviews and win awards. There's no guarantee, but those aren't the measure of success. The measure of success is pride and self-satisfaction in your own efforts because those other things are passing and arbitrary and, and you, you give them too much power if you let them decide whether you're happy, whether you should stay up at night, right? You need to be your own judge. You need to trust in yourself and, and, and be kind to yourself, right? And, and you're human, we're not, we're not machines, we're, we're people. And just know you're doing your best every day and get up again the next day and do it again. And uh, that will get you very far. Don't give up, don't give up. If it's what you want to do, stick with it. And there may come a point where you go, you know what, it's not what I want to do. Well, that's okay. Then you know, you're, leaving, you're walking away because you've decided you want to walk away but don't give up because of fear or discouragement or critics or, or any of these other negative things in, in any, anything you do in life. I think we got to the end of the questions and I've talked at you for an hour. Thank you so much. That was, that was incredible. Honestly, very inspiring and motivating. Um, if does anyone have any remaining questions before we wrap this up? Not at all? Okay, well, thank you so much for making the time. I know you're super busy, so thank you. we really, really appreciate it. I wish you all the best. It. Thank Please you stay so, safe much. And well. thank you so much. Well, hope to see your work. <laughs> thank you. you Have too. a lovely okay. evening. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank